All right. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Hello. How good was the keynote? How good was Saskia? Holy cow. You know, we practice what to do when it goes wrong, but we didn't practice it going wrong in that way. She was amazing. I'm so proud of her. All right. Well, this is new ways to visualize time. Now, before we start, I have some housekeeping. Uh, the first thing I'd like everybody to do in this room is raise their hands. Everybody. Right. Now, keep them up. Uh, you may put them down if, if you are going to fill in the feedback survey slide at the end of this session. You may put them down if you're going to fill out the survey. <laughs> I've got my eyes on you. <laughs> right. It's, you're, going to get, you're going to see this slide in every breakout session. Um, you know, we do these sessions an awful lot, and I don't know what I'm doing right or wrong if you don't tell me. Uh, so if you see something you love, tweet about it. If you see something you don't like, put it in the survey feedback. But please, everybody fill in some feedback. Secondly, uh, I'm going to show you loads of links about history and philosophy and loads of Tableau demos. Uh, take notes, take screenshots, go nuts. Uh, but it's, everything is at the end of this URL, and this should be live right now. And you will see this URL at the end and on various slides throughout. So everything I'm going to talk about is at the end of this. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about visualizing time. There are two other great sessions on time uh, in the schedule, which unfortunately I forgot to build a slide for. So if you're interested in using time as an analytical object, uh, go check out Bethany Lyons, and I've really, I've forgotten the name of the person who's doing the other session, but search for time. There's some other great related sessions. Uh, well, I'm, this is me. I'm Andy Cotgrove. As you heard in the keynote, I, I wrote a book. And uh, I'm really delighted to give this session today because there's a, one of the chapters in this book is essentially new ways to visualize time. So if you like this and you like the book, awesome. Uh, as James said, I've been using Tableau for over 10 years, and writing the book was a big itch. And releasing it was a great honor and privilege. Reviews were generally really good on Amazon. So that's been uh, incredible. But I'll share with you my favorite review of all. This is my daughter, Lucy. Uh, she's, she's now nine years old, and last year in, when we were on holiday, she kept a journal, and we found this, well, I found this, it was one of her pages in her book, and said, this is my dad's book, and I think it's really boring, because it's about dashboards. It's like, Ugh. So, I obviously have some work to convert her to a data rock star, but uh, you're in the room, so I'm sure you're all already rock stars. Uh, right, but here we go. This session is all about this. How do you visualize time? How do you visualize time? Anybody? Line chart. What was that? On the x-axis. On the x-axis. Oh, well, that's a good answer. On the x-axis. We will investigate that in depth. Uh, clocks, that's a good way of doing it. I think in 2018, this seems to be the reality of life as you contemplate the infinite universe and your position in it, as you just spend your time looking at mobile phones, watching time go by. But this is what most people will say when they've got time in their data set. It's the line chart. It's an amazing piece of ingenuity. I love the line chart. We should all love line charts. We've got position and slope and angles to see trends over time. Right. Hurrah. But boom. Uh, what I want you to leave with today is the realization that the timeline, brilliant as it is, is going to hide as much insight as it will, will reveal. And as I've seen customers over the last 10 years and done it myself, sometimes we start and stop on a timeline and it's, we're missing loads of great insight in the data. So the answer to the question, how do you visualize time, is it depends. Uh, this is the answer you should always give if somebody asks you how to visualize data, because it always depends. This is the clue to being an expert in database. So here's the agenda. We're going to do a bit of philosophical existential considerations for a few minutes, then a little bit of history, and then we'll get to spend about half the time in the session in Tableau. Sound good? Brilliant. Phew. Don't need to change anything then. On we go. Right, so the first question is, which way is time? You know, this is, it's, I know it's, it's 10.34. Might be a bit deep after a big night last night if you're an England fan. I want you to all think about this question. and uh, right, Just go with me. Just close your eyes. Everybody close their eyes and think about this present moment. You know, you're listening to me witter on. But think about, right, we're here in the present. Now, consider yourself in the present. And now think about tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow. What's... Just consider that as a concept. And then as you think about today and tomorrow, give tomorrow a physical place in relation to where you are now. Right, so where is tomorrow? 
It's a strange question. So everybody, eyes closed. Now point, point, bravely and boldly, without poking anybody, to tomorrow. All right, I'm, seeing, not, I'm not seeing everybody pointing, but you know, I'm seeing a bunch of points. Right, OK, keep pointing. Open your eyes. Which way did we point? Uh, who pointed forwards? Right. Why did we point forwards? Anybody? We're always moving forwards. We move forwards, we fall back, back in time, looking forwards. Yeah, that's kind of a common way of doing things. Did anyone point to the right? So left to right. Why did you point left to right? Reading. And what was that one over there? It's the direction of the x-axis. Yeah, we're so conditioned. right? We read left to right in the Western world, uh, and that's, that's kind of the way we do it. Did anybody go up or down? Yeah, why? Growth opportunity. Nice, I like it. Positive thinking. Any reason why you went up? So you don't poke anybody. Brilliant. <laughs> right. So, uh, right, here's a totally irrelevant, trivial fact, right? When you talk about human, the planes in human beings, you've got the x axis, the, the, the y axis, and this is called the sagittal plane. Does anybody know why it's called the sagittal plane? It's to do with human anatomy. No? Right. When you're, born, you're, when you're born, your skull is kind of split apart. And as it knits together in that line, which is, is in that direction, that's called the sagittal structure. Amazing. Right. <laughs> anyway, I discovered that researching that. But we all, most of us in the Western world point forwards. Uh, so why don't we visualize time in this direction? Well, this is why. Here's a really great piece of work by the Wall Street Journal showing the NASDAQ around the period of the dot-com bubble and dot-com burst. Uh, so they did this a few years ago, and off we go on this roller coaster ride looking at the NASDAQ. Now, if you have time and equipment, and if you've got VR goggles, you can put this on and actually watch this in, three, in reality as you go on this roller coaster ride looking at that. Here we go. We're going to go up to the dot-com uh, boom. For those of you less than 25 years ago, this was a time when the internet was called the information superhighway. Oh, those good old days. And then in March 2000, it all kind of went tits up, really. Here we go, down the roller coaster, right? Wow, amazing. Now, that is visualizing time in the orientation that we kind of most feel it fits most naturally. But it's not practical, is it? Right? You, you, you'd see that once, and you go, that's cool. But it's too time consuming. Uh, so that's not a good thing. So up and down is a way we can do it. Uh, this is a great visualization from the webcomic XKCD showing time on the uh, y-axis, which is unconventional. Uh, this is showing the global temperature of, of the, the average global temperature of the Earth over the last 20,000 years. So we're starting at 20,000 BC. Uh, here is warm, over there is cold. Uh, so and this is going to animate pretty quickly, but keep your eye on the dotted line. As we go through 20,000 years of time, I recommend you go and check this out. The annotations are really interesting and kind of funny. And you can see the dotted line. Things are getting warmer. And as we slow and get into the 20th century and the 21st century, it's uh, actually, we can do this. Look at that. It's terrifying, right? What's going to happen? Um, that's the optimistic scenario. This is a really impactful way of visualizing data on the vertical axis. Uh, and you can do this in Tableau. Absolutely do this in Tableau. Uh, this is a great piece of work by Mike Kisneros, who's a Tableau Zen master and is here in the audience. Hello, Mike. I love this piece of work. It shows the price of oil on the left-hand side and the price of gold on the right-hand side. The white line in the middle shows the variance between the prices, and it's a 30-year time axis on the of time duration on the y-axis. Really great piece of work. There's no reason you shouldn't do this in Tableau. And I predict. We're going to see more and more visualizations with time on the y-axis, because this is how we experience the world now. You scroll up and down. And that scroll on a narrow screen lends itself to kind of a, you know, using the thumb as a piece of time, right? So you can scroll through things to see a progression through time. So I think we'll see more of these as we go into the, as we move forward into the future. Do you see what I did there? Right. <laughs> uh, but this is where we are mostly with most of our visualizations based on time. And we got here through an amazing set of historical innovations. Uh, so indulge me in a little history lesson. 
If anybody's got looked into the history of data visualization, it's amazing. And what we do today without thinking in Tableau is built by pioneers who were doing stuff 250 years ago. So timelines, we'll start in 1753. At this period, it's the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And people are thinking about chronology. The chronology was a really big thing. You know, People were beginning to look back and think, how did humans get here? And there was all sorts of ideas about how you could represent history. And along comes Jacques Barber Dubourg, who was a French botanist, physician, and writer. And he created this, the Chronography Universal, uh, in 1753. What he did was collect data on loads of famous people and famous events, when they were born or when the event happened. And at the top, he did this. And what this is, is the first time anybody ever did a regular scale x-axis using time. This is ground zero. So before this, people had kind of started and started and done time going left to right, but nobody had thought, well, I could put it on a scale. Bam. You know, we don't think twice about this now, 250 years later, but he came up with that. Uh, now, the great thing about this chart is it spanned 2,000 years, or maybe not the great thing, uh, and he didn't really think about the size of that scale. So the fully folded out chart was 16 meters long which is about the length of this room. Uh, so he had a problem, and he came up with another great innovation. He, he housed it in this wooden scrolling device, right? And it, it was portable, that's cool. But it also had these little uh, tiny scrolling things here, so you could very slowly scroll as if you were using an iPad, right? He actually came up with that iPad concept <laughs> hundreds of years ago. Uh, like an iPad, it was extremely expensive. And unlike iPads, he didn't sell very many of them. But uh, there's one in the Princeton University, and it's on my bucket list to go and see it. So we have 17, uh, uh, 1753. 12 years later, that influenced a guy called Joseph Priestley, who was another polymath who did some incredible things. But the thing he did that's relevant here is this chart. Uh, this is the chart of biography, which is pretty much the same thing. 2,000-year time span, 4,000 names, uh, and here they are. Now, the horizontal groupings, are, he grouped them in types of people, like what well, we've got statesmen, uh, div divinists, warriors, poets. Uh, so that's the, that represents the horizontal band lines. And there were a few more innovations he added. The first of, the first of which was he thought, well, I've got a piece of paper this big. I might as well make the x-axis fit on it. So thank God that for that. Otherwise, we'd still be making 16-meter-long charts. Uh, but the other thing he did was... Uh, visualize a couple of things. He visualized the birth and the death date. So actually the lifespans of all these famous people. So he actually created the Gantt bar about 150 years before Gantt invented the Gantt bar. So go Priestley. Uh, he also didn't know when Pyrrhus was born. And he, he used triple dots to show where data was unknown or unclear. So he was visualizing uncertainty all this time ago. And visualizing uncertainty is one of the biggest challenges I think we have in database. Today, he came up with a really, really cool way of doing it. This was massively successful. It was printed thousands of times and hung on walls around Europe. And then, Duborg to Priestley to 1786, influenced by these two men, along comes this chart by William Playfair. Uh, many of you have probably seen this. This is sort of classified as the first ever statistical line chart. And it was done by William Playfair and published in the Statistical Breviary in 1786. And this is great. He nailed it, right? He's got annotations. He's got really nice grid lines. He's got a caption, nice title. Uh, this is showing economic, a comparison of eco economic imports between Denmark, England, and Norway. Uh, look, good use of color. I mean, this is brilliant. Wouldn't this look good in Tableau? Yes, it would look good in Tableau. In fact, it looks great in Tableau. Um, thank you, Playfair. We do have one advantage over him, though, uh, in that now we can use tooltips. So he, he couldn't do tooltips, but uh, you know, at least we can do that now. So, look at that, right? We just throw a pill on a shelf, you show me to visualize time, and yet what you're doing is using at least 250 years of history uh, of people who are creating these new ideas with pen and paper and with no previous experience of data visualization. They were intuiting incredible ways to visualize time. And this is where possibly one of the downsides of our automated society began to come into power. 
You know, when, we were, when people were building Excel and the first, you know, VisiCalc and the first spreadsheets and the first visualization tools, it was really hard to make a chart. Uh, so we've all been trained to like build a line chart, we're done. And yet what we need to do now, we're going to go into Tableau and see that maybe if we took some of this creativity and use some of the great tools and like, things we can do in Tableau, can we find different insight beyond the line chart? So with that intro over, let's spend some time in Tableau. Let me just put this down without spilling. Right, what I'm going to do is show uh, six or seven like, line, uh, different versions of time charts, depending on how the time goes. And we'll start with the line chart in just about every one. I'll explain the data because we changed the data here and there. And I'll show you different ways we can visualize time. Uh, so we're starting off with the 100 meters world record. Usain Bolt, boom, destroyed the world record in 2009 with this incredible time of 9.58 seconds. Like, you, you know, this, this line, look, the timeline's great. It shows that steep line just shows how much he smashed the record. And you can see that this is a time span of uh, 100 years. So we have a timeline. This is great. We can see, what was it? Jesse Owens was at 10.2 in 1936. And it, it wasn't until 20 years later that Willie Williams broke the record with 10.1 seconds in 1956. Line chart, good, right? But the issue is, this isn't really what happened to the record. Oh, there's a text from my wife. <laughs> we'll ignore that. <laughs> I'll tell you a story about one day I didn't ignore one of those messages on a live stream in front of thousands of people, but I'll save that one for day to night out. <laughs> yeah, right, anyway. Uh, so, right, where was I? The timeline, right, the, the, the record did not do this. There wasn't like a 10.3 second record in the middle of this time period. So I just want to show one of the new features we've added in Tableau this year, um, something called the step line. When you have a line chart, you can hit the path shelf, and then you can choose the different line type. You can do a step line. Boom, and we're done. Now, this is great for this kind of data, because Jesse Owens set the record at 10.2, and the, the record was 10.2 seconds all the way until 1956, and then uh, that 10-second moment when Willie broke it. Uh, you can also remove the drop line with this by using the right-hand side, uh, right-hand one of these options. And again, this is just down to the nature of the data, uh, what, what, what's the most relevant thing to show. And uh, a nice thing you can build is, you know, here I've built the same chart, but I've done a dual axis chart. So you've got a dot and a label for Jesse Owens, and you can see each of these 100-meter uh, records there. So that's called the step line, and we added that in 10 point something this year, uh, but it's now in Tableau when you upgrade to the latest version. Number two, we're going to do something called a slope chart. Uh, this is London cycle hire data. Uh, you're probably mostly familiar with the schemes. You, you hire a bike in a docking station somewhere in London. You ride the bike around, and you put the bike in a different docking station. So I've got data for the year of 2017, and I've shown a line chart showing the number of journeys from eight of those stations. And the line chart's great. We start in January, um, and what I found interesting in looking at this, this data is I would have expected all stations to peak in the summer and then drop down again in the winter. But what I actually found was that some of the stations see that peak. Uh, these two are around Hyde Park. So what we're obviously seeing is a lot of leisure riding in the summer, whereas some of the other stations actually don't see that peak at all. And these are kind of the more commuter belt ones where it's a little bit more uh, consistent. So this is great. The timeline's showing me something really interesting. But if you look at the question at the top, I says, well, what's the difference between the start and the end of our data? In this case, the timeline is hiding insight because it's generating noise. I'm not interested in any of these marks because they are not the start and end of my data. So I'm just going to exclude them and create what's called a slope chart. Now, what I love about this is that there's something hiding in this data that I bet nobody saw. One of these chart, uh, stations went from number eight to number one in this timeline. And in fact, if I highlight it and then press undo, you still can't really see that really strong insight. You, know, you have to work hard to do it. 
So this is called a slope chart, and it's really powerful when you, all you are interested in is just the start and the end of your data. If all that stuff in the middle is noise, then just don't show it. What I did here was create one in an ad hoc way, just grab the dots and uh, exclude them. But if your data's updating, you might need a more dynamic solution. Uh, so this is a dynamic version. What's happening here is as I change the filter, so do narrow down the months of time, then the slope chart updates accordingly, and I can choose that. So imagine if, um, if you had the filter set here, and this was just, you know, the data's updating, and you were always comparing the latest data to a period maybe a year ago or a week ago. What's going on here is uh, a calculation. Uh, in this case, I'm using a table calc called first or last. Basically, this says for every line that's on the chart, is it the first mark or the last mark? That will return true or false. And then I hide, which is something you can do in Tableau with marks, I hide everything that is uh, not the first or last. Again, I'm not going to show the demo, but on the URL that we talked about, there's a blog post link to that. Dynamic slope charts. We love them. I love all these chart types. Right. Uh, next, number three, cycle plots. Uh, same data set. And my question is, what do the hours of 8 a.m. and noon look like across journey numbers in London? Uh, now I've got all bike journey data from a 12-month period. And this is quite a nice chart, actually. Each pane is a day of the week, broken down into 24 hours of the day. Uh, so we can see on a Sunday, there's this nice peak around noon. Everybody's out cycling around, the you know, going to brunch and having their hipster avocado breakfasts around noon. Whereas on Monday, um, and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we have this uh, peak at 8 a.m. and at 5 p.m. So weekdays are for commuters, as you can see. So the line chart is great. But the question here is, what do the hours of 8 a.m. and noon look like? And in order to answer that question, I've got to do some really fiddly stuff. I'm like, well, there's 8 o'clock on a Sunday. Uh, there it is on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You know, and, and I'm, I'm doing this really inefficient lookup across all my marks to try and find 8 o'clock in each one of these days. So how do I concentrate on just individual hours and maybe look at trends across a week within an hour? Well, one thing we can do because it's the question is just visualize hours. This is weekday. I'm going to drag that off and just visualize journeys by hour of the day. This reveals something very interesting. But it, look, right, this reveals that most journeys happen at 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. But you just saw something that was a little bit more nuanced than that. Because if I undo, the aggregated journey count doesn't reflect what happens on a Saturday or a Sunday. Uh, so we need to do something else. One thing we can do is put weekday on the color shelf. So I'm going to take weekday and put it on the color shelf. And now we're seeing that aggregated information, but we're seeing the difference between weekends and weekdays. So week weekends are in red. They have the leisure pattern. Weekdays are in gray with the commuter pattern. But that's not a cycle plot. Let me show you what this is. Right. A cycle plot is a chart which takes a bigger time slice, like weekday, and instead of putting it to this side of hour, it switches it and puts it on the other side. So we're going to take the big, whoop, we're going to take the bigger time slice and put it to the right-hand side of hour. So this isn't the default way that Tableau visualizes data, but it's just a drag and a drop to create what is called a cycle plot. It's a really nice chart when you're looking for seasonality. Here's 8 a.m. What happens during the hours of 8 a.m.? Well, on a Sunday, everyone's in bed, and then people start commuting on a Monday. People are really commuting on a Tuesday. Then the weekend kind of starts, clearly, because we get to Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So with this data, you get this really nice N-shaped pattern for 8 a.m., which is completely different to noon, uh, which has a U-shaped pattern because more people are riding London bikes um, at this time of day. So cycle plots are really good. And think about this with your data. Anything you do that has maybe customer behavior, uh, visits to your website, visits to your physical locations. Are there trends at different hours of the day that can be broken, looked at in a bigger picture like this? So that's the cycle plot. Um, 
sometimes this might be better for your needs because one of the downsides of a cycle plot is it needs to be quite wide. And if you're going to put this on a dashboard, you need quite a lot of real estate. Uh, so you can, you know, one like this can be made really small and we can still see lots of the difference very clearly. Okay. So I'm now going to switch to a, a, a very sober data set. Uh, and the reason I use this is I, I blogged a lot about this data set a couple of years ago. And it's uh, fatalities on the roads in the US. Uh, in this case, I've got 1994 to 2016, so two years ago. This is the latest data available. And again, I want to find seasonal trends. Now, the timeline is showing something interesting, as always. Uh, we can see the peak year, uh, 43,000 uh, fatalities on roads in the US in 2005. And then things dropped around 2009. Uh, this was partly because of the economic downturn, but also because of new policies on child restraints in the back of cars. So great. And then you can see a plateau for several years. And then, unfortunately, this rise since 2014, which is 14% more fatalities since then. And unfortunately, this isn't just about there being more cars on the roads. This is actually married in car miles traveled and number of licensed travelers. So something not good is happening in the US. But I want to find seasonal trends. How does a month of the year look like? Uh, or how do each of the months look like broken down over all the years? Now, that's the same question I just asked when building a cycle plot. Uh, so let's build a cycle plot looking at year and month. So I click on the, just in case, it, in case we've got beginners to Tableau, I'm going to click on this to expand the time hierarchy. And then you can drop down uh, on, on this one and choose a different time, uh, time dimension, time part. So I'm going to go year and month and then drag year onto the other side of the month to make the cycle plot. Now, the problem I have here is that this chart isn't as aesthetically pleasing as the cycle plot with the cycle data. Uh, and it's because every month kind of has the same pattern in it. So one of the things I want to really emphasize in this talk is that sometimes the data itself determines which data or which chart you want to use for uh, seasonality. You know, it's no accident that I chose this data to demonstrate the cycle plot because of this N and the U, which is very, very clear. Here, uh, oops. Here, things, it's just not, it, the insight doesn't quite jump out. So we're going to look at this in a different way. I'm going to create what's called a highlight table. I'm going to take year and put year on the row shelf. What I want is months along the top, years down the bottom, so we can see every month and every year in a sort of matrix structure. That's not it finished. That is ugly. For those new to Tableau, I just want to explain one of the, if, if you're, has anybody been using Tableau for less than six months here? A few people, right? One of the things I highly recommend you focus on getting fundamentally in your head is the difference between green and blue pills. Once you understand this, you're going to have like, you're going to be able to make Tableau do anything. When you have a green continuous pill on a shelf, Tableau will draw an axis, right? It's a rule. It's just a fundamental law. Whereas when you, if you take that, oh, and when you have a blue pill, Tableau will break the, break the space into panes. So at the moment, I'm telling Tableau to draw an axis. But what I, what I want to do is drop this onto the color shelf instead. So now we're going to say, don't draw an axis. You've just got two discrete, you've got discrete pills on the columns and rows. Draw me a table instead. Let me just undo that. There's an axis. And I've, re I've set the color scheme already. Now we're looking at months along the top, years down the bottom, and we can see the seasonal trends much more clearly. Uh, August, July are the months of the most fatalities. August, uh, July 2005 was uh, you know, the, the peak of deaths in this data set. And you can see that in the last two years, the, the growth has kind of happened in the summer months. So this is a really good way of visualizing data, and you can shrink these and grow these quite nicely. Uh, and of course, you're not restricted to just doing month and year. With the power of Tableau, I can change and say, ask a question about calendar days. So I'm going to change from year to month on the rows. Uh, I'm going to change the color ramp as well, just so you colors pop out a little bit, little bit, little bit better. Each cell represents 
one calendar day. And what jumps out here is, in fact, it's today, July the 4th, is the most dangerous day to be on the roads in the US. Right? I mean, God, that's today. That's, that's awful, isn't it? Uh, also, during January the 1st, New Year's Day. So the highlights say, this is great. You can just play, you know, quarter, month, week. Just play around with these things on the columns and rows, and all sorts of stuff will jump out at you. And now we can talk about one of the big challenges that I think we all face, and I've, there's been a perpetual challenge since I started using Tableau and 10 years ago. Uh, let me know if this is familiar. You fall in love with Tableau or the idea of data visualization. You are like, boss, we need to buy this product. Tableau is going to change everything, or data visualization is going to change everything. You're all excited, but then you get worn down by the, I just want a cross tab. <laughs> yeah, right. We know that, right? Just show me the table of numbers. <sighs> right. I don't have the magic answer to that question, I'm afraid, but there are some things we might be able to do with this to give that boss a little teaser and sort of pull them, pull them down the path to the beauty of data viz. Uh, so here's, here's a highlight table, looking good. Why not put the number inside the highlight table as well? I'm going to duplicate fatalities on the text shelf and now change this. Instead of automatic, I'm going to change it to a square, which essentially forces Tableau to build a highlight table. So now, maybe I've got the boss one step along the way. I'm like, here's your, here's your table, boss. Here's your table. But we can look at the numbers. We have the eyes drawn to the numbers that are most important. And then I think we can go one step further. You can go, here's your table, boss. But you know what you could do? Well, you know what you could do as the Tableau analyst is do one of the new features we added again this year is the viz in tooltip. So I'm going to give the boss this cross tab, and then I'm going to insert a sheet. So this is a viz in tooltip. I've gone into the tooltip, I've done insert sheet, and then I've got loads of sheets in here. Whoops. Uh, I'm going to add in fatalities per hour. Uh, you can play around with some of these settings. And I'm going to click OK. And now we get them to look at July the 4th. And the chart shows fatalities per hour for hour of the day on July the 4th over this time period. Now, this is, I mean, this is, this is a very sober data set. I, I apologize for bringing this data into it. But what you can see is that on today, the most of the fatalities are going to be in the evening. Uh, so that's kind of over here on the right-hand side. Whereas in, on January the 1st, most of the fatalities happen in the early morning. So this is incredible insight with a highlight table broken down with a vision tooltip. And you know, the, but these ideas could be the steps you could do to try and get people away from it. You know, be like, cross tabs are great. I like a cross tab, right? Woo, it's cool. But you can maybe pull people along with you to the idea of this. And maybe one day they'll invert it and say, show me the line chart and put me the, give me the cross tab inside there instead. Uh, yep, that's the finished version. Where are, we, where are we going next? All right, let's show a much happier cross tab. How common is your birthday? This is one of my favorite uh, cross tabs ever. I think Andy Creable was the first one to build one of these. This, this version exists in, in our book. Is anybody's birthday today? Yes, happy birthday. All right. Woo. Uh, what? what What's your nationality? Are you English? German. German. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't have German data. But what, what this is showing, this is showing every calendar day colored by the rank of popularity of that birthday in sort of all 366 days in a year. So July the 4th is the 33rd most popular birthday in, the, in England and Wales. And if you're one step ahead of me, I mean, this, the, this data is incredible. July the 4th in the US is ranked 361 because no hospital employees want to work on July the 4th. So nobody gets born on this day. Uh, you can see the same thing. Thanksgiving is really low. Uh, Christmas, day, oh yeah, Christmas Day, anybody on the 26th or the 25th? Yeah, what's, what's your birthday? 25th. 25th, yeah, look, you are... Um, 365th. I mean, the three, what's, actually, what's amazing about this is 26th of December is actually ranked lower than February the 29th, which baffles me, but it's true, right? So we can see these holes in the data, and you can see July, August, and September are the busiest uh, months in both. Does anybody have a birthday on the 26th of September? You do? Oh, I love it when this works. 
26th of September, you are number one. That's amazing. Did you know that? Are you English? Oh, <laughs> it, might be, <laughs> it might be, I don't know what it is. It's, it's uh, 27th in the US. Uh, two, two last things I love about this. Look at this, this horizontal stripe here. Um, look at it. This is the 13th. And notice how, I, I can't, notice how the 13th just has this little blip. People don't, people are superstitious. And Valentine's Day, for some reason, has a little spike in the US. I'm like, anybody on the 14th of Feb? No? Because oh, I'm like, that's, that seems a bit strange to me. But anyway. Anyway, so highlight tables are great. And the reason I show you this is because if we plot, the, this is the line chart of live births by day in England and Wales in 2014. Uh, and it's like, ugh, that's crazy, right? The line chart is not very pleasing on the eye. It actually does show something extremely interesting. All of these troughs are weekends. So lots of births Monday to Friday, lots of doctors playing golf on a Saturday and Sunday. Um, so it reveals a lot about how birth is managed as a service in England, Wales, and US. So there we go. That's a highlight table. I'm going to show you one more highlight table. Uh, and we, I'm going to flip the data set on you. We're now looking at drought in the US. Uh, OK, so this is another highlight table, year down the side, months along the top. Red is a time of severe drought in the USA. Same trick you can have. Here's uh, July 2012. You can break it down, show the states in the tooltip so you can get a nice little uh, indication of what's going on. But the reason I show you this one is because, actually, that's a whole set. All that red cell, why not put the map inside the square instead of on the tooltip and create what's called a small multiple? So to do that, I need to put state onto detail and latitude onto the correct shelf. Right, I'm going to drop latitude on a shelf. Hands up if you always put latitude on the wrong shelf first. Yeah, right. I've done this demo thousands of times, so hopefully I'll get it right first time. Latitude and longitude, boom, look at that. A small multiple map. Uh, here's one I prepared earlier. No, here's one I prepared earlier. Showing the drought index in the US from 2007 to 2018. Uh, this was an inspired by this was inspired by a wonderful piece of work that the New York Times did. Uh, you can actually go and download this data from 1895 to 2014. It's pretty cool. But this shows us more than the highlight table did. Uh, you can see 20 2012 was a really bad year for drought in the U.S. But actually, Washington and Oregon and some of those Northwest states didn't experience something so bad. It was really bad in California. And with interactivity, you can just press a, set, press a state and highlight that state across all those years. Uh, what you're seeing here is actually that three to four year cycle of drought to not drought, back to drought. And that's the El Nino effect, the weather uh, system that affects the Pacific Rim every few years. So the point of this one is highlight tables. We love highlight tables. Uh, but within that space, on the, on the, within that sort of cell, you can draw a chart. It could be a line chart, a map, or various other things. And there's another version of the same thing. Oh, that's the entire thing. Right. Uh, let's just go back to the US road fatalities data. Why did I switch data and not draw a small multiple in this chart with this data set? Well, let's have a look. Here is that same small multiple, the same structure. Years uh, down the side and months. Oops month along the top. The reason I didn't build that chart is because the chart is really boring. Uh, unfortunately, fatalities in the US are in the same place every month. I mean, it's largely driven by population, California, Texas, and Florida. But again, the point is, I showed you this in the cycle plot. Be driven by the data. When you are exploring data, it's not just a case of going, I want to look at seasonality, therefore, Tableau said, draw a cycle plot or a highlight table, the data will tell you which chart you need to show to. So we'll always be exploring to find the best articulation of the data. All right, last one, and then we will go back to uh, PowerPoint and wrap up. Uh, we're looking at YouTube data. Unfortunately, we can't update this data set because they don't report the data anymore. But these are from August 2016. These were the 10 most popular videos on YouTube. Um, should have, I should have done a pop quiz here, see if you could guess which ones they were, but some of you can read that uh, legend. Uh, so this is views over time of the 10 most popular views videos in YouTube. 
Uh, Gangnam Style. Do you remember internet prehistory in 2012? Uh, 72 million people watched that video in a single week. Most of them, I believe, were Matt Francis. Uh, <laughs> but, and that felt amazing. That was like, wow, YouTube revolution. But that was dwarfed in 25th of October 2015 with the Dow. 129 million people. Boom. That's amazing. Uh, that has actually been surpassed, but again, we can't, you can't download this data in the same way anymore. Okay, so that's good, right? The line chart shows these peaks and troughs. Awesome. But the question at the top says, which one hit 1 billion views first? <laughs> I've no idea, because the line chart is hiding the answer to that question. In order to solve this, we need what is called an index chart. What we do with an index chart is change the x-axis. Instead of putting time on the x-axis, we show an index of days since something happened. Right? So in this case, I want to know how many people viewed each of these videos since the first day it was released. So at the moment, we've got things happening at different time periods. I want to collapse all those time periods and say, well, this is the release day of that thing. And for that, we need to do an index chart, which, again, this is the most complicated chart I'm going to build. I've pre-built all the uh, calculations just in the interest of time, and there is a blog post to go and find this. So what we need is an index no, 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 first what we need is a running total field. So I'm going to put running total onto the row shelf. And instead of counting the views week by week, we just accumulate them over time. So there's a running total. Uh, you know, it's a bit easier to answer the question. I'll add a constant line for a billion rows so we can see where it is. Uh, so I'm dragging a constant line onto the measure I want to choose. And then a billion is what? One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That looks about right. And now the complicated bit. I, it, instead of week, I need to use the index chart, the index field. So this is just a calculation that looks at a, a series, in this case a line, and says, just give me an index of zero to x for each one of these. So I'm going to put that on here. I'm going to take week off. I need to put. Uh, I need, in this case, I need a discrete date for every date field. Boom, did it. Right, if you didn't follow the instructions, go and look at the blog post. Um, but here we go. Here's my answer. Uh, this is an index chart. Adele took, oh no, where's the, oh, that should, right, let's reset the tooltips. Adele took 90 days for a billion people to watch that video. Just, it's just uh, incredible. Whereas Gangnam Style, the granddaddy of like, hugely watched videos, took 160 days. Uh, Taylor Swift, Shake It Off, my favorite, uh, took, I, I have kids, I have two girls, right? You've seen one of them, I have girls. We've listened to, we've listened and watched this video many, many times. Um, it was a good video though, right? Yeah, surely. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I digress. It took a year for that to hit a billion. One of the things we're seeing, actually, if you do look at the top 10 YouTube videos, is you see these things now. Uh, this is a Russian cartoon, Russian animation. There's a lot of these slow burners. And now as uh, a lot of kids are being let to watch a lot of YouTube, you're seeing these things take over as the most watched videos on YouTube, which personally I find a little scary. But uh, that's what this one is. Whew, right. There you go. That was six charts. Everyone. Worn out? Does anybody want to see one more? Yeah. Wow, wow. Hey, careful. Do you want to see 10 more? <laughs> 20. 20. I've got loads more. <laughs> I'll just show one. Um, animation's interesting. So I'm going to take you back to the summer of 2016 while there was an election going on. And th this, this was a viz we did with Makeover Monday, and it shows polling data uh, nearly until the election of Trump and Clinton. Each one of these columns, each one of these bars, represents a state in the US. And we had uh, polling data for every state for every time there was a polling data. So we had polling data for the duration of uh, the election. So I'm going to animate it and play each day as we went through that election season. So the line chart, the line chart is going to show you the swing between Trump and Clinton. So this is, blue is uh, the, the, the polls are in favor of Clinton. The y-axis is also showing that uh, swing. So the further down, was that, was, that indicates that the polls were swinging towards Trump, and up meant they were swinging towards uh, Clinton. 
And I've ordered them from the most Trump state, which was West Virginia, to the most Clinton state, which was uh, whatever this one is. I can't see. Uh, Hawaii. Right, now I visualized this because I thought, I, I, I had this hypothesis that different states of different political uh, persuasions would, would swing differently. And then I was just kind of mucking around, and you can see over time that actually all the, all the states swing at the same time. When Trump did something stupid, woof, they all went against him. When Clinton did something stupid, they all went against her, but all in conjunction. Uh, so you can use animation in Tableau. This is using page shelves, and again, blogged at the end of this link. Uh, so I was, I was quite proud of that one. Uh, right, I'm going to stop there. We're going to go back to Tableau. But there's, more, there's a few more charts on the blog. Right, let's go back. There we go. That's a uh, gorilla logo design. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, well, we saw it in Tableau, didn't we? So let's recap. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed seeing those six charts. Hopefully they're giving you some ideas. Uh, in recap, there are three things I want you to take away. First of all, the line chart is amazing. Actually, that's a free thing to take away. The line chart's great. But they hide insights, right? The slope chart, the cycle plot, the highlight table, the small multiple, the index chart, the animation, all reveal things that the line chart doesn't show you. And Tableau makes it so easy for you to just try these things out. You can make 30 views in 30 seconds and discount all but one, right? And that is why I fell in love with Tableau 20, uh, 20, 10 years ago when I first downloaded it. Secondly, the data itself can determine the best view. Uh, the cycle data makes a great cycle plot, but the fatalities, fatalities data didn't. The drought data makes a really good small multiple, but again, the fatalities data did not. So again, use that exploration. You know, work out which charts, how to build all these charts, and just throw things on the canvas and then delete them and undo. You, use Control Z in Tableau all you can. And then finally, the final one is, I, you know, I'm a, I, I'm a real nerd on the history of data viz. It's an incredible topic. Amazing pioneers over a 250-year history, or even longer if you want to go back almost to the world of cuneiform or the first written field. Uh, every, next time you build a line chart, just think, you know, these guys had pen and paper. They had no idea where to put this field. Playfair had no idea that a line chart played into uh, the brilliance of our pre-attentive attributes, our, our, our cognitive abilities. Uh, and yet these guys did it. Unfortunately, it was all guys at that time. It was Florence Nightingale, first woman to come along and do some cool stuff in Dataviz. But I'll leave you with this quote. And so this is with a quote. This is Joseph Priestley, who did the uh, chart of biography. When he released this in uh, 1786, he also released this pamphlet, a description of a chart of biography. Uh, again, I, this is a really interesting thing to read because you know, I spent a lot of time reading blogs about Tableau and data visualization and people described uh, the challenges, the process, what they did and why they did it. That's what this does. This is a 20-page blog explaining the challenges of data visualization and how we found the data. Right? Not only that, he actually printed all the underlying data in the pamphlet. So you could go and rebuild this chart uh, if, you, if you could be bothered digitizing all those 4,000 names. Uh, but he, was, you know, he would have been a Tableau Zen master, right? He was an absolute data rock star. Uh, and there's many great quotes in the book, but there's one that I love, which is it's a quote that comes in two parts. The first bit is about data collection and cleaning, and the second part of the quote is about visual exploration. Uh, so I'll leave you with this. He says, laborious and tedious, as the compilation of this work has been, if, we, if he'd had Tableau prep, I mean, it would have been easy, right? But he didn't. But then he went on to say... Um, a variety of views were continually opening upon me during the execution of it. And this, this is what I want every single Tableau user around the world to be doing. It's that joy of just dragging and dropping fields around and being like, oh, this is interesting, this is interesting, this is interesting, and finding that best articulation of the data. Because that's what I fell in love with 10 years ago. That's why I'm still working with this company. And that's what I hope you all can get from your data. Uh, so. I'm afraid I've got, I haven't got time for questions because I've got to shoot off. So with that, you all put your hand up. You all put your hand up, so I expect you all to fill in the session survey. All the information I've just given you is available at the end of this URL. 
I hope you have a really good conference. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Thank you.